Amen. Praise the Lord. I uh, enjoyed the revival. I enjoyed sitting in the pew and taking notes on sermons. And I'm glad to be back up here. You know, uh, uh, I want to share with you something that came out of our time this week in prayer. Uh, be, prior to the revival, uh, we had two weeks of round-the-clock fasting and prayer. And every day at lunch, people were meeting here to pray. And, you know, I just, didn't, I, I have to tell you, that was such a time of refreshing and such an enjoyment to me that I just couldn't give it up this last week. So I came every day at lunch and prayed here in the, in the auditorium. And I had some just wonderful times with the Lord. And one of the things that came out of that time with the Lord this week is what I'm going to share with you this morning. Uh, I, I, uh, I feel like that uh, about Wednesday, the Lord shared with me uh, in my own heart uh, the essence of the Christian life. The essence of the Christian life. And I want to share that with you this morning. I think it's something we could write up there on the, on the, on the wall and, and have it there all the time. We could put it out there on the, on the street. Uh, the thing that came to me while I was in the middle of prayer right here in the altar was my life is about this. Knowing God and making him known. That's it. That's the whole thing. You see, uh, if, I, if I take my time of my life, it doesn't matter. You know, I know I have to work. You know you have to work. If you want to eat, you have to work. Amen? The Bible says your stomach craves it of you. You're going to have to eat if you want to work. And you're probably going to have to eat. You're probably going to have to work. And did I say that backwards? Yes, I did. <laughs> You're probably going to have to work if you want a place to live, and you're probably going to want you're going to have to work if you have to uh, have something to drive and something to wear and those types of things. But I want you to know that life is more than clothes, and life is more than where you live, and life is more than than the the job that you have. In fact, if your job defines you, I feel sorry for you. Especially if you name the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lord and Master of your life. Because our life is not our own. It has been bought with the price and the price is not silver and gold, but the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that he shed on Calvary. And if my life belongs to him, then the greatest thing in my life is knowing him. And I'm not just talking about salvation. I hear so many people today that talk about God and talk about their relationship with God as if it were something that happened in the past. Oh yes, I remember. I was, uh, I was this old and I was at this place and this was going on. and that. I want you to know I'm happy for anyone who remembers and knows when they got saved. But you know what? My being married back there in, in 1972 does not uh, constitute the whole of my relationship with my wife. Every day I've gotten to know her better. Every day our, our relationship, sometimes it hasn't deepened, sometimes it's stretched and thin. You know what I mean? But, you know, at this time... It's almost as if I know what she's thinking and she knows what I'm thinking and sometimes I wish I knew what she was thinking. Amen? But knowing her has been part of the journey in our relationship with the Lord. It's not just about a ticket to heaven. It's not just about being forgiven of our sins. It's not just about what God can do for us that puts us at the front of the process. That puts us in the driver's seat. God never intended for us to be in the driver's seat when it came to our relationship with him. He is the Lord. He is the master. He is the one who wants us to know him. He already knows us. 
He doesn't have to strive to know us. He knows our rising up and our setting down. He knows when we go in. He knows when we come out. He knows the very number of the hairs on our head. He knows the thoughts, our most intimate thoughts of our heart. There is nothing. There is not a word in our mouth that God does not know it before we speak it. And yet we are almost ignorant of God. My, one of the things I learned when we were growing up, you know, we didn't say idiot. That was against the rules. You can't say idiot. So we said idiot. <laughs> you idiot. And I want you to know there's a lot of Christian idiots. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Know practically nothing about God and aren't even trying. Don't care. Hey, I'm busy. You know, I'm a student. I got this math to learn and this, these, uh, these specimens to examine. And, I, you know, I've got all this stuff. I'm working. You know, I'm working. And I'm good at what I do. And we boast about ourselves. And we boast about our accomplishments. When what we ought to be boasting about, God said, let all boasting, let all boasting be in him. Amen. So if you will, turn with me to Philippians, the third chapter. I'm going to share a few verses with you this morning just to talk to you about this particular subject. I want you to know that you can't know God until you know him through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, some people want to study God. There's atheists that study God. I, th I find that very interesting. You know, they study something they don't believe in. That's, that's strange to me. In fact, there's a lot of people in the church, they study God in Sunday school. And, then, and if, the, if what you study in Sunday school never becomes a part of your life, then you're one of those people who's just studying God. You understand what I'm saying? And if you don't know him personally as the Lord and master and savior of your life, you can never come to know him as he is. Now, I want you to know that God's all about the business of revealing himself. In fact, the Bible over in, in the book of Hebrews tells us that God has spoken to us. He has revealed himself to us at different times in different ways. Uh, we've been studying the book of Daniel and we've been studying some of those visions. We've been studying some of those dreams. See, God spoke to the heathen king, Nebuchadnezzar, through his dreams. God will speak to you if you want to know. There was a fellow in the New Testament, his name was Cornelius. He was a good guy. I mean, he gave a lot of stuff to the poor. I mean, he, he was going out of his way to do that and he spent a lot of time praying. And one day, God spoke to him. God said, send for Peter. He's over there in the Tanner's house. And he sent for Peter. When Peter showed up, Peter got up and started saying, I've come to share with you Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit of God fell on that place. Now, I want you to know Cornelius was a great guy. And Cornelius had been studying God. And he had been studying how to be good. But he didn't know God because he didn't know Jesus. And when he heard about Jesus, his spirit soared. And the Holy Spirit of God came and sealed him and filled him and made him one of God's own. And from that time on, I believe that Cornelius began to know God better and better. When we look at the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul was one who had greater revelation than any man that lived on the face of the earth at his time. God took him into the desert for three years and explained to him the intricacies of the, of the secrets of the kingdom of God. Things that had not been revealed before. He said before it was a mystery. Now it is revealed. It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. People didn't know that before. And all of Paul's life, he would over and over and over again say what he says in this passage. I want to know 
him. I want to know God. I want to know Jesus Christ. Here's what he says. In, in, uh, have I got time? I don't know if I have time to read the whole passage. All right. Verse 7 says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for what? For Christ. For Christ. He didn't say, I counted those things lost for a better life. For a better way of living. For a better standard. No, he said, I counted those things but lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but lost for the excellency of what? Of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung. Nice, polite King James word there. That I may win Christ. Amen. That I may win Christ and be found in him. And not having mine own righteousness which is of the law. But that which is through faith of Christ. The righteousness which is by God. Which is of God by faith. I want to tell you something. That's the only kind of righteousness that counts. Not your righteousness. Not my righteousness. But the righteousness that is of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And, and Paul comes along here. And he, he explains this. He says, that I may know him. I want to tell you something. This is the object of our life. That I may know. Well, where are the Gary? I, I met Jesus, you know, many years ago. I'm asking you, are you still getting to know him? Because see, Paul had more revelation than any man in the New Testament. He spent more time with Jesus personally than any other person in the New Testament. He was taught one-on-one, -on -one, the best kind of teaching there is in the world, from Jesus Christ himself. And yet, he strove, still, right here, with all the revelation. He said, I only have one desire, that I may know him. Do you know why Paul said that? Because... The more Paul knew about God, the more he realized the wonder of God and the vastness of God and the, and the immeasurability of God and the, and the greatness of God. And he said, every time I learn something more about God, I see how much more I don't know about God. I want to know him. Is there a desire in your heart this day to know God? I'm not just talking about being saved. I'm talking about just like David cried out over and over in the Psalms. Lord, Lord, teach me your ways, O oh Lord. Teach me yourself. We know because of Romans the 8th chapter that God's very intention is in our life is that we take on the very likeness of Jesus Christ in our lives. Now, I want you to know something. You take on the likeness of the person you spend the most time with. You know, that's why these kids that grow up and they say, I hate my dad and I can't stand my dad and I don't like the way he does things and I don't like, you know what they become? They become just like him. You know why? Because that's what they focus on all their life. They take on, they may not act exactly the same way, but they take on the same characteristics. And I'll tell you something else. Any enemy you got, you're going to become like your enemy. You focus on that enemy. You don't focus on the forgiveness that God calls you to do. You're going to become like that enemy. And you know why people aren't coming to know God? Because they're not focused on God. They're not focused on coming into his presence and spending time with him. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Paul said that I may know him. And what? The power of his resurrection. Well, that's good. I want to know the power of his resurrection too. But Paul said, I also want to know the fellowship of his suffering. I want to, I want to be a partaker in the very suffering of Jesus Christ. I want to tell you something. The closer you get to the cross, the more you understand the suffering that Jesus Christ did for you and for everybody else on the face of the earth. When I think back over my life and I think of all the wrong that I've done and I think of all the, the stupidity in my life and I think of all the rebellion in my life and I think of all the, the hard-heartedness in my life and I go back to the cross and I see it all right there. 
I see it right there. And then I'm amazed that he loves me. But I want to know him. I want to know the one who loves me just the way I am and is willing to take what I am and change me into what he wants me to be. And that's good news. See, the bad news is when I don't want him to change me, I want to be my own person. Amen? You see, knowing God means I'm going to change. Knowing God means I'm going to change. He said that I may know him and the, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering and being made conformable unto his death. You know, that, that this word conformable means that we're going to be made into his image. It means we're going to be made into his shape. Now, God's invisible, so it doesn't mean exactly that, but it does mean we're going to take on his character. And folks, I want to tell you something. If you've been in Christ a year or two years or five years or 10 years or 15 or 50 years, and you are not taking on the character of God, you're still your own character in spades, then something's wrong with the relationship that you have with God. Something's wrong with the relationship that you have with the Word of God. Something's wrong with your prayer relationship with God because you can't spend time in the presence of God and God not call you on the carpet about what's not right in your life. What is right in your life? Amen? Paul says, I want to know him. I want to know him. Now, turn with me for just a minute to 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter. 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter. That's to the right, for those of you who have a little hard time uh, navigating your Bible. 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter. Paul says in verse 3, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Godliness is something we don't like to talk about in our society today. We like to talk about godlessness, but we don't like to talk about godliness. All right, Godliness. He says, if any man teach otherwise, that's the way he is. He says in verse 4, he is proud. What do we know about pride? God's against it. He opposes it. He hates it. It's an abomination to him, according to him, and he's going to punish it. Pride. So, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, Brother Gary. I'm proud to be an American. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If you're more proud to be an American than you are to be a son of God, something's wrong with you, too. He said he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy and strife and railings and evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. What's he talking about here? He's talking about a know-nothing. He's talking about a know-nothing. Somebody that's a know-nothing, they're proud. And they're proud of themselves. And they're proud of their knowledge. And if you talk to them about God, they're proud of their knowledge of God. And if you talk to them about anything else, they're proud of their knowledge of that too. They know everything. Now you may not feel like you know everything, but you may still fall into this category if, if all you want to think about is the questionable things of the Word of God. Well, let's get into this thing about, let's get into this thing about this little doctrine over here. What, what, wait a minute, wait a minute, Brother Gary. Do you, do you really suppose that Jesus Christ was dead or did he just swoon on the cross? The Bible says he was dead. You know, how many angels do you think can stand on, the, on, a, on a point of a needle? That used to be the big theological question. 
You know why? Because they were know-nothings. See, he's proud, knowing nothing, knowing nothing, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words. You know, you bring up the word commitment. People want to make a different, everybody wants to have a different uh, definition of what commitment means. You bring up the word faith, everybody wants to have a different definition of what faith means. When you talk about grace, everybody wants to have a different definition of what grace means. You know what? They don't know the Lord, so they don't know his words. And so all they're going to be doing is disputing about words all their life. And I want to tell you something. You can stay in the word disputing business. And the, one of the characteristics you're going to find out about yourself is that you think that gain is godliness. Oh, well, I must be doing something right. I got a raise. Well, I must be doing something right. I've been advancing. I've been getting more, you know, money, I, my money's starting to add up a little bit in the bank. I'm starting to get that savings. I got that 401k. That must be godliness. No, it's not. You just may be a know-nothing. Amen. That's what God said. I didn't say it. That's what God said. Now turn with me over to Titus. You're just still going to the right. Skip over 2 Timothy and go into Titus and look in the first chapter of Titus and look in the 16th verse. The last verse of the, of the chapter, and I, I, there's some other verses that we could take in there, but we're just going to, for brevity of time, we're going to jump right in here in verse 16. It says, they profess that they know God, but in works... They deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and every and unto every good work reprobate. Now, people that profess to know God, Paul pegged them here when he's writing to Titus. He says they profess to know God, but in works, they deny. You know, the way they live, they deny. The way they talk, they deny. The way they dress, they deny. The way they act and react, they deny. The priorities of their life deny him. Their checkbook denies him. Everything about them in works, they deny him. It says, being abominable. Now, you know, the only thing you have to be, do to be abominable is just be proud. Just be proud. And there's other things we could add to that, but if you're proud, that's the way it is. And, and it says, and they're disobedient. You see, to every good work, they, but in works they deny, and that's not just the things they do that are wrong. That's also the things that God says do that we don't do. When God says, you're going to be my witnesses, and we refuse to be God's witnesses, then we deny the Lord Jesus Christ with our works, even though we say we know him. If we say this is the word of God, and I believe that this is the word of God from cover to cover, even the cover that says Holy Bible, but I don't read it, and I don't study it, and I don't memorize it, and I don't meditate on it, then I guess what? In works I deny that I know him. Even though I say I know him. If God calls for purity in my life, and I'm hung up on every skirt that walks by or every guy with some kind of muscle bulging out. You know, if I'm focused on the, if I'm focused on the outside and not what God has for me to see, you know what? I'm denying God through the works of my eyes and through the desires of my heart. I'm denying, that, even though I say that I profess to know God. Do you understand what I'm saying to you here? You see, knowing God... You can profess to know God and you can be disobedient and to every good work you can be reprobate. That means you, you wouldn't even go close to it to touch it. Amen. Alright. You know, I, I'm going to 
Oh, we got to have the Lord's Supper, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm halfway through with my message. All right. I, I'll just refer you to this. You can write it down. John, in John the 10th chapter and the, and the, excuse me, John the 4th chapter and the 10th verse, Jesus was talking to the woman at the well. And he said, if you only knew the gift of God, and the one who is talking to you. What was he trying to do? He was trying to introduce himself to this lady. Because when she came to know him. She went and she told everybody else. Come and meet a man who told me everything about myself. Jesus said if you knew the gift. You know if you're here this morning. And you don't know the gift of God. That is eternal life. You're lost. If you don't know the one that said that, Jesus, you're lost. But if we do know him, then we should want to know him. Amen? Now, turn over to Proverbs, the sixth chapter. I'll start the second half of the message, and I'll try to finish as quickly as possible. This is something I, I, maybe I shouldn't do, but... Proverbs 6, verse 3. You already know the verse. I just got to find Proverbs in my Bible. I know I'm... I'm I, made, I made it to Isaiah. I'm almost there, okay? Y'all hang in there. Proverbs, the sixth chapter, and the third verse. How many of you know that verse? He says... I think I wrote it down backwards. No, it's the third chapter in the sixth verse. I wrote down the sixth chapter in the third verse. I did that yesterday on my bank deposit. They didn't appreciate that. I made a 59 into a 95. And uh, my numbers didn't, uh, didn't jive with their numbers. But they straightened me out, all right? In the third chapter of Proverbs, in the sixth verse, it says, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit of thine increase. Well, we're going to stop there. You know, this is the second half of it. He said... In, in verse 5 trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding verse 6 in all thy ways acknowledge him now when you say in all your ways acknowledge him well, that doesn't mean yep yep you're there yep you're good yes you're Lord that isn't acknowledging the Lord you see when he says in all your ways acknowledge him he's talking about in all your ways make Christ known make him known in the way you live make him known in your priorities make him known in the desires of your heart make him known in the words that you speak to other people make him known in your appearance make him known by the way your house runs make him known by the priority of his word in your house make him known by the priority of his house in your life amen you see i believe it when we talk about acknowledging him or making him known when David prayed in Psalm 51 I believe it was about verse 3 he says I acknowledge my sin and my sin is ever before me now he wasn't making his sin known to God amen but he was making known that he knew that he was a sinner. In your life, two things need to be happening that may not be happening. One, 
You need to be seeking to know God. And two, the things that you come to know about God, God wants you to make known to others. You see, my life, the essence of my life as a Christian, the essence of the life of this church is knowing God and making God known. And it can be summed up in that and we don't have to go any further. Oh, we can flesh it out. We can, put, we can put details in. But it boils down to that. Knowing God and making him known. Now the question to you and to me and to everybody in this auditorium is, is how, how busy, how, how, how much work am I putting in to knowing God? And how much am I conscious of making him known Every day in my life, everywhere that I go, with everybody that I meet, in every situation of my life, whether it's a business dealing or whether it's a personal conversation. You see, if those things aren't true in my life, then I'm missing out on the very essence of what God made me to be. I'm missing out on the very truth that I have been known of God. Okay, then I'm going to leave it all with him. He can know me, but I don't have to know him. You know, I want him to make me known. When I stand before him, I want him to make me known. I want him to say, yes, that's one of mine. But in the meantime, I'm not going to make it known that I'm one of his. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? In our lives, the greatest thing we can do is to know God and to make him known. And if I've been going about my business, if I've just been going about my life, and I have been saying that I know God, but in works I've been denying him. Or if I'm just one of those know-nothings that just goes around talking about disputing about words and causing strife and problems every which way, not knowing God and not making God known, just making my ignorance known. God wants to do a work of grace in your heart and in my life. We're going to have a time of invitation. I know time is time. Let's stand together. Father, we ask you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that the word that has been spoken this morning would be through the power and the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God and that this invitation would be your invitation and that you would call those to the altar that need to be in the altar and you would call people to salvation that need to be saved. And Lord, that you would call your children out of lethargy and out of sleep. This I ask you in Jesus' name. Amen.